We live in the world, but do not fight as the world fights. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Our weapons have power of the divine to demolish strongholds and arguments against the knowledge of Christ. Take captive our thoughts and our doubts, Lord. Make them obedient to Christ. Now let's sing a hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? <laughs> serious, don't worry. All right. Let's all pray together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Almighty, Almighty God, God, through your only Son, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection by the renewing of your spirit arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for today comes from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, and we'll read the first 34 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. Now, brothers... I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, 
though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our second scripture is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. We'll read uh, from chapter 10, the first 11 verses. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. 
By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For, lo for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You are looking only on the surface of things. If anyone is confident that he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. For even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up, rather than pulling you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters, for some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Well, we've been talking over the past few years, really, about the foundations of our faith and the ways in which they've been eroding away in our church and in our culture. And we've talked about belief in the Bible and the lack thereof. And we've wondered why our children and grandchildren seem to be running away from the beliefs, values, and principles of our parents and grandparents. And we're facing up to the fact that they have stopped going to church because they found answers elsewhere that make more sense to them. They've been told and taught that the Bible can't be trusted, that there are better answers to the questions of life than what they learn in Sunday school or from the hypocrite in the pulpit. However it has happened, their priorities have changed, right? They found more important things to do with their time than to go to church on Sunday or to read the Bible after school. And in many places they've been ordered not to read the Bible during school, which is a crime that we've done nothing about. And you know, I could get very animated and upset about some of this stuff, in fact I sometimes do, but I want to talk calmly and rationally about it today, amen? What on earth is happening to our country, our culture, and our church, for heaven's sake? Calmly. Calmly. Yeah. But don't you feel that way sometimes? Yeah. Like you just want to go outside and scream it? Yeah. Right? There are many aspects of this whole situation that we could discuss and address. And it could take a long time. But I'm just going to focus for a few weeks on answering some of the issues that arise when people consider and question Christianity, creation, Jesus, and the Bible. We need to know what are their significance and relevance to the modern world, or should I say to the postmodern world, especially the resurrection as we head into Lent and Easter here. You know, most of us who are more than 30 or 40 years old grew up in the age of modernism. 
And modernism contains the idea that humans have the ability to reason their way to truth, logically. Postmoderns today reject that idea. See, people today, especially the young people, are looking for meaning and purpose in life because they're being told and taught that there is no real truth, that everything is relative. What's true for you might not be true for me, they hear and they say. But since Jesus Christ claims to be the way, the truth, and the life, there's obviously a big potential for conflict there between the two claims, right? Well, I mentioned before a minister named Ray Siervo and his book, Apologetics, for the rest of us. In it, he explains a situation and the resulting dilemma we find ourselves in, in this way. He says, sadly, our 21st century culture has denigrated or outright rejected absolute truth. In our culture, truth has been categorized as relative, unknowable, or non-existent. And these three categories are strikingly similar. After all, if truth is relative, we must ask, relative to what? It has to relate to something. And if it's only relative to relative, then it is unknowable in itself, because that is nonsense. It must be relative to an absolute. And this is both sad and funny at the same time because logically the statement that truth is unknowable relies on the truth. And that truth is unknowable. Follow me? <laughs> that means we know the fact that truth is unknowable to be true. But the truth is actually proven to be true by the very assertion that there is no truth. You get it? <laughs> they say that there is no absolute truth, and they are absolutely certain that is true. See what I mean? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it seems silly, and we've talked about it before, but I want to illustrate some of the thinking that we're dealing with these days, okay, or a lack of thinking, right? Here's the truth about truth. We cannot deny the truth without using it. Give it a try. It doesn't work. You can't do it. Whether we are talking about knowing the truth or the truth about moral absolutes, we cannot deny either one without actually using them. Consider the Ten Commandments, for example. If you're talking about them, someone might say, Don't preach to me about morality. There are no moral absolutes, and it is wrong of you to judge me. Well, what he's really saying is that it is always wrong to make statements about moral judgments. And yet, he is stating a moral judgment saying that it's wrong of you to tell him that he is wrong, all the while insinuating that none of it can be done while he's doing it. Anyway, becoming aware of this kind of illogical thinking can help us as Christians to communicate the gospel message to people who respond to us this way. That's, the, that's what I'm trying to get at here. People really are taught and think that way and respond that way these days. And it can catch you off guard unless you have that in the back of your mind that that's where they're coming from. And the church has not paid a lot of attention to the truth. Now I'm not talking about the gospel, but about the idea of truth. 
See, when the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 that the church is the pillar and support of the truth, he's referring to the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, the gospel is only true if it corresponds to reality. In other words, the gospel, in other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true if the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are in fact actual events, then it is the truth. But if Jesus never really existed, then the gospel is not true. And even Paul agrees with this when he says that if Christ did not rise from the dead, we among all people should be most pitied. That's basically what he was saying in our first scripture. And this is because we would be believing and declaring something to be true that was not real. And as the pillar and support of the truth, we, the church, are to guard the truth and guard the gospel. And the church has not done well with this. We've been giving it up piece by piece compromise by compromise, until we now find ourselves at a point where many people in the church and those who have left the church aren't sure how much of the Bible is actually true or not. And this is why I spend so much time talking about the truth of Genesis, for example. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ can only be true if the in-the-beginning accounts are in fact actual events. If some of the Bible is not true, then none of it can be true. And these days, unbelievers understand that. And therefore, they don't believe the Bible or what the hypocrite in the pulpit says. And I'm taking the time to talk about this because, in general, the church has not fully recognized what kind of battle it is in today. And in reality, it's the very same battle that it's faced since the time that Satan first deceived Eve. You know, we're not just recognizing and adjusting to the new conditions in the culture. It's much more than that. We've given up too much ground and not had the tools or weapons ready to defend our faith, as I've been saying for some time. So what do we do? Well, it starts with taking the time and making the effort to understand some of these things. And it means reading the Bible more. It means asking questions about topics that we ourselves don't understand. It means researching and studying some of these issues so that we have something to say when questions come our way. That we become better able to recognize our own doubts and misconceptions in order to better help others with theirs. And I know it might sound like a lot of work and inconvenience, but I can assure you it is endlessly interesting. And it's really just plain fun, too, when you get right down to it and into it. See, God intends it to be that way, interesting and fun. So let's talk a little bit more about truth and answer a couple key questions here. One big question that many people have is, why did God require animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? That's something a lot of people can't get past. Mm -hmm. And in October, we talked about the Day of Atonement, remember? Uh, also known as Yom Kippur, which was the most solemn holy day of all the Israelite feasts and festivals. And on that day, the high priest was to perform elaborate rituals to atone for the sins of the people. It was such an important, solemn day that everything had to be done just God's way, 
so the people could be forgiven of their sins. The blood of bulls and goats could only atone for sins if the sacrifice was continually done year after year, however. While today, Christ's sacrifice was sufficient for all the sins of all who would ever believe in him. When his sacrifice was made, he declared, It is finished! And no more of that was ever needed. And then he sat down at the right hand of God, and no further sacrifice was ever needed. Talks about that in Hebrews chapter 10. Now, Jews today still <clears throat> observe that day because most of them have not yet fully recognized Jesus as the Messiah, who sacrificed himself for them. They were expecting something else. We look at that day a little bit differently, which we talked about before. But we rejoice in the fact that God gave up his son for us. But non-believers question this whole idea of atonement, especially the animal sacrifice part. So they often ask, well, why did God require human sac require animal sacrifice? sacrifices in the Old Testament. Well, it's because people were making human sacrifices for one thing. They were doing that in the land of Canaan and nearby areas. But God required animal sacrifices to provide a temporary covering of sins and to foreshadow the perfect and complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ. See, animal sacrifice is an important theme found throughout Scripture because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When Adam and Eve sinned, animals were killed by God to provide clothing for them, to cover them. God had warned them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or else they would surely die. And when they disobeyed, they should have died right then and there. But God showed mercy and delayed their death. God commanded the nation of Israel to perform numerous sacrifices according to all these procedures to cover their sins, just like the first garments that God made. And you still may be asking yourself, but why animals? What did they do wrong? And that's the point. Since the animals did no wrong, they died in place of the one performing the sacrifice. Jesus also did no wrong, but willingly gave himself to die for the sins of mankind. Jesus Christ took our sin upon himself and died in our place. And as 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And through faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, we can receive forgiveness. So animal sacrifices were commanded by God so that people could experience forgiveness of sin. The animal served as a substitute. That is, the animal died in place of the sinner, but only temporarily, which is why the sacrifices needed to be offered over and over. And then animal sacrifices have stopped with Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate sacrificial substitute once for all. He is the lamb that was slain. Animal sacrifices foreshadowed Christ's sacrifice on our behalf and God's plan to rescue and save us. God loves animals, yeah. but he made people in his image. We are his family. We're not just animals. And the only basis on which an animal sacrifice could provide forgiveness of sins is Christ, who would sacrifice himself for our sins, providing the forgiveness 
that animal sacrifices could only illustrate and foreshadow temporarily. It's a long answer, but that's pretty much it. Another question we often hear, why is God so different in the Old Testament than he is in the New Testament? Well, this question shows a basic misunderstanding of what both the Old and New Testaments reveal about the nature of God. Some people say, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and anger, while the God of the New Testament is a God of love. Well, the Bible is God's progressive revelation of himself to us. Through historical events and through his relationship with people all throughout history, we learn more about him as we read through from the beginning. And when one reads both the Old and the New Testaments, it becomes clear that God is not different from one testament to the other, and that God's wrath and his love are revealed in both testaments. Throughout the Old Testament, God is declared to be a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Think of all the terrible things you read about that people did in the Old Testament and how he showed them mercy and continued giving them more chances. In the New Testament, that's confirmed as God's loving kindness and mercy are displayed through the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And throughout the Old Testament, we also see God dealing with Israel the same way that a loving father deals with a child. Think about it. When they willfully sinned against him and began to worship idols and other things instead of him, God would punish them. Yet, each time, he would deliver them once they had repented of their idolatry. And this is much the same way that God deals with Christians in the New Testament. For example, Hebrew 12, 6 tells us, The Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. And as we read and study the Bible, it becomes clear that God is the same in the Old and New Testaments. And even though the Bible is 66 individual books written on two or three continents in three different languages over a period of approximately 1,500 years by more than 40 authors, it remains one unified book from beginning to end without any contradiction. And in it, we see how a loving, merciful, and just God deals with sinful men in all situations. Truly, the Bible is God's love letter to mankind. And what a better thought going into this week of Lent, Ash Wednesday, and St. Valentine's Day to realize he is the ultimate lover. He gives us the ultimate love letter. Throughout the Bible, we see God lovingly, mercifully calling people into a special relationship with himself. And he's God. You know, not because they deserve it or we deserve it, but because he is a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and in truth. Yet we also see a holy and righteous God who is the judge of all those who disobey his word and refuse to worship him turning instead to worship gods of their own creation, as we all sometimes do. 
And that's also the answer, by the way, for those who question God's destruction of the innocent Canaanites when Israel occupied their promised land and God told them, go kill those people. The Canaanites were not innocent. They were offering human sacrifices and all kinds of other deplorable things. They deserve destruction. Because of God's righteous and holy character, though, all sin, past, present, and future, must be judged. Yet God, in his infinite love, has provided a payment for sin and a way of reconciliation so that sinful man can escape his wrath. And we see this wonderful truth in verses like 1 John 4.10 says, This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So in the Old Testament, God provided a sacrificial system whereby atonement could be made for sin. However, this sacrificial system was only temporary, temporary and merely looked forward to the coming of Jesus Christ who would die on the cross to make a complete substitutionary atonement for sin. So the Savior who was promised in the Old Testament is fully revealed in the New Testament. And what about that hypocrite in the pulpit, huh? Why are Christians such hypocrites? Well, that question stings a bit, doesn't it? Because hmm? it's partly true. You know, all people are hypocrites. I certainly am. See, hypocrisy means play-acting or pretending. And Christians sometimes pretend to be better than others, or holier than thou. And because we preach God's rules and cannot live up to them all consistently, we are <coughs> called hypocrites. And the best answer to this one might be, most of us try not to be, but we're human. That's why we need God so desperately. We don't always tell the truth, but we do know the truth. And this hypocrite in the pulpit only wishes for you to know him too. You can be forgiven. Your sins will be atoned for. You can reach that place of at one meant with God. You don't need to sacrifice your pets. Just offer yourself as a living sacrifice to Christ. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Accept his sacrifice for you. How can you find him? Where can you meet him? He's waiting for you with open arms at the cross. Amen? Amen. Let's sing that. At the cross. <laughs> Yeah. 
sacrifice for you. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to him. Humble yourself and he will lift you up. We'll finish with shalom to you.